so far in our discussion on proteases, we focused on serine proteases, and we discussed three examples of serine proteases. So we discussed chymotrypsin, trypsin, and elastase. Now we said these three serine proteases all use the same catalytic triad. So in their active side, they have this collection of three amino acids that work together to basically promote the hydrolysis of peptide bonds. And out of these three amino acids, it's the serine that acts as the nucleophilic agent. Now, what about the other categories of proteases? So remember, we not only have serine proteases, but we also have cysteine proteases, aspartyl proteases, metalloproteases, and we have other examples of proteases that we're not going to focus on in this lecture. So the question is, what exactly is the mechanism of these other proteases and how does the mechanism differ or how does it compare to the mechanism inside serine proteases? So let's begin by briefly discussing cysteine proteases. So in cysteine proteases, we also have amino acids in the active side that work together to basically catalyze the cleavage of peptide bonds. But unlike in serine proteases, in cysteine proteases, it's the cysteine residue found on the active side that acts as that nucleophilic agent that will cleave that peptide bond. And to see how that actually works, let's take a look at the following diagram. So we have a cysteine residue in the active side of some particular cysteine protease. Now, in the form that we have cysteine here, cysteine is not good, it is not a strong enough nucleophile. So the sulfur as shown here is not a strong enough nucleophile and it will not be able to attack the carbon of that carbonyl group on that substrate molecule because this simply isn't a good enough nucleophile. So what must happen is another residue must work together with the cysteine to basically transform it into a better nucleophile. So how does that actually take place? Well, in a similar way to how it takes place in serine proteases. So we have a nearby residue, for example, a histidine, and on that histidine, we have this nitrogen, which contains a lone pair of electrons. On top of that, the nitrogen can also have or also has a partial negative charge because it's more electronegative than the nearby carbon atoms. Now, if we examine this H on the sulfur, we see that the H contains a partial positive charge because the sulfur is more electronegative and the sulfur contains a partial negative charge. So what we see happening is before the substrate actually enters the active side, what begins to happen is the nitrogen, because of its higher electron density, begins to pull on this H ion. And as the H ion is being pulled away onto the nitrogen as shown in this particular diagram, these two electrons in the sigma bond move closer to the sulfur atom. And that increases the electron density, the electron cloud around the sulfur, and that increases its ability to act as a nucleophile. So as the H atom is being pulled away onto the nitrogen of the nearby histidine residue, we see that these two electrons move closer to the sulfur and the electron density on the sulfur increases. And so as we have this incoming substrate molecule, these two electrons attack nucleophilically the carbon on the carbonyl and that displaces the pi bond. And so once this step takes place, we form the same type of tetrahedral intermediate that we formed in the serine protease reaction mechanism. And just like in serum proteases, we can have an oxyanion hole that stabilizes the negative charge on that oxygen once we form the tetrahedral intermediate. In cysteine proteases, we can also have a similar type of oxyanion hole that stabilizes that relatively unstable and high in energy tetrahedral intermediate. 
Now, of course, eventually the tetrahedral intermediate will collapse and after a few processes, we're going to basically break that peptide bond in a, in a similar way to how we broke the peptide bond in serine proteases. Now, two examples of cysteine proteases are caspases. These are those enzymes involved in the process of programmed cell death, so apoptosis, as well as cathepsins, which are involved in immunity. Now let's move on to aspartate proteases, also known as aspartyl proteases. Now, the major difference between cysteine proteases and aspartyl proteases is the following. In cysteine proteases, as well as the serine proteases, we see that one of the residues inside the active site of the enzyme acts as a nucleophile. But in aspartyl protease, the residues don't actually act as nucleophiles. Instead, it's the water that will ultimately act as the nucleophile. Now, the similarity between, let's say, cysteine protease and aspartyl protease is we still have to transform the water into a good nucleophile. In the same way that we had to transform the cysteine into a strong nucleophile before the nucleophilic attack took place, in this particular case, we see that we're going to have residues that will transform the water into a better nucleophile. Now, if we examine the active site of aspartyl proteases, we're going to find two residues. One of these residues will be aspartic acid and the other one will be aspartate. So this is basically the same thing as this, but this is in the deprotonated state and this is in the protonated state. So we have aspartate, we have aspartic acid. Now, when water moves into the active side, the negative charge on the aspartate will interact with the positive charge on one of the H atoms. So we have a partial positive charge here because the oxygen contains a partial negative charge. And so by the same uh, by the same analogy, here, when the nitrogen pulls away the H, it gives the electrons to the sulfur, and so the electron density on the sulfur increases and it becomes a better nucleophile. Here, when the negative charge, the oxygen, pulls away the H, it makes the oxygen a better nucleophile because we essentially transform water into a hydroxide, and the hydroxide is a much stronger nucleophile. At the same time, what happens is the other residue, the aspartic acid, uses its H to basically interact with the oxygen of the carbonyl. So the oxygen here contains a partial negative charge and the H here contains a partial positive charge. And so as they interact here, what begins to take place is we basically make the carbon of the carbonyl a better electrophile. So the ultimate reason why we have these two different, uh, we have the aspartate and the aspartic acid is because one transforms the water into a better nucleophile and the other one transforms the incoming substrate into a better electrophile. And now we can have our reaction take place. The similar reaction, the same type of reaction that took place here. We have this bond breaking, forming a bond with carbon, attacking the carbon nucleophilically, displacing the pi bond, forming that same type of tetrahedral intermediate. Except now, instead of having a bond between this residue and the carbon, we have a bond between the oxygen of the water and this carbon. So inside the active side of these proteases is a pair of aspartic acid residues. They work together to transform water into a good nucleophile so that it can hydrolyze that peptide bond. So what happens is the deprotonated aspartic acid, the aspartate shown here, uses its negative charge to transform the water into a better nucleophile. So we essentially create a hydroxide. And then the protonated version of the residue, the aspartic acid uses the partially positive hydrogen to basically interact with that partially negative oxygen of the carbonyl and that creates a good electrophile. And now the reaction can take place at a relatively high rate. Now, two examples of aspartate proteases that we're going to focus on in future lectures is renin, and this is basically the enzyme
that is used to control blood pressure as well as pepsin and this is one of the digestive enzymes that is found in our digestive system. And finally, let's take a look at metalloproteases. So just like the name implies, this has to do with the fact that inside the active site of metalloproteases, we actually have a metal atom. And usually the metal atom is zinc. So what's the point of the metal atom? Well, for the same exact reason that we have this residue to basically transform the water into a better nucleophile. Here we also have a metal atom to actually bind the water and transform it into a better nucleophile so that the water can basically hydrolyze that peptide bond. So if we examine the active site as shown here, let's say we have the zinc metal atom that is actually bound to the active site of that enzyme. And so what it does is it interacts with the oxygen as a result of this being partially negative and this having a positive charge. So they form this bond. At the same time, some type of nearby residue acts as a base. And usually the residue is glutamate. So this acts as a base and basically grabs off the H. It pulls the H away from this oxygen and that transforms the oxygen into a much better nucleophile. So it creates that hydroxide. And now this can act as a nucleophile attacking the carbon of the carbonyl and once again forming a tetrahedral intermediate. And then following several steps, we basically collapse and break apart that tetrahedral intermediate and eventually we hydrolyze that peptide bond. Now, one example of a metalloprotease that is found inside our body is carboxypeptidase A. And this is once again another example of a digestive enzyme. So we see that even though we have many different groups, many different types of proteases, we have serum proteases, cysteine proteases, aspartyl proteases, metalloproteases, and so forth, all these different types of proteases basically function in a very similar way. What they ultimately do is they transform a bad nucleophile into a good nucleophile and they transform a bad electrophile into a better electrophile and so that ultimately we have a strong nucleophile attacking a very good electrophile and that's exactly what increases the rate of that uh, uh, the rate of that reaction, the rate of the hydrolysis of that peptide bond.